Well, hello there. Welcome to Hearthside Stories with Parliament House Press. I'm Jennifer Sidaway, the host of this year's event, and we are going to be having several Parliament authors join us throughout the week to read a short, spooky story that they wrote specifically for this occasion. Tonight's guests are going to be Ren Handman, Carla Lewis, and Lola Lawson. As soon as I see Miss Wren in the audience, I will invite her up to join us. Those of you who decide to stick around and comment like this post will be eligible to win an ebook copy of her book, Wirewing. So let's get this party started. I am so excited. Halloween is my absolute favorite holiday of the year and <laughs> I can't help myself. Let's see if I see Wren in the... There she is. I'm going to have her join me really quick. She should be coming up any second now. Hello, Miss Wren. How are well, you? Hello. <laughs> I'm great. How are you? Look at you with your antlers. You are so cute. I figured since I had a forest themed story, I would embrace it for my costume. Heck yes. <laughs> You will notice I actually have a co-host with me tonight. Oh, does he have a name? Harvey. Perfect. <laughs> Love From it. From the Chilling Tales of Sabrina. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> so I was telling the viewers before you logged on, if they decide to stick around, comment, and like this post, they will be eligible to win an ebook copy of your book, Wirewing. Very exciting. I know. Thank you for that's what I'm saying. I actually have not read that book by you. So, you know what? I might have to buy a copy for myself. One of these get, some, get some Kleenex ready. Oh, no. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Ben, why do you do this to me? Oh, yeah. It's a, it's a heart render, that one. Oh, man. <laughs> All righty. So, tell us a little bit about your story. Mm, well, I was very inspired by spooky campfire tales, and I was actually at a cabin with some friends staring out at the forest when I wrote it, so you'll be able to see very clearly what I was inspired by. <laughs> yeah, do you remember, um, like, two decades ago, they did the, uh, like, Are You Afraid of the Dark? Oh, I that loved Are You Afraid of the Dark. It was my favorite <laughs> series when I was yeah. a kid. So okay. good. Well, without any further ado, let's dive right in. All right, here we go. In the foothills of the Rockies, people do not fear the noises in the forest. They are familiar with the trees that creep ever closer to the small patches of civilization they have carved from the great darkness. Pine needles blanket their tiny yards, but still the flowers fight towards the pale sun. Bushes rustle and things move unseen, but only when your back is turned. But they do not catch their breath and freeze. The people do not fear the noises in the shadows. They do not fear the anger of the ancient pines. They do not fear the presences they sense in the endless forests. They fear the silence. Ah! When bird calls no longer echo unseen, when small creatures no longer shift and scurry in sudden flashes of movement, when even the wind has stilled, and the trees keep their own secrets, that is when you should run. Do not stare too long into the shadows. Do not breathe too deep of the haunted air. Do not look back over your shoulder, even for a moment, or all will be lost. In the foothills of the Rockies, the people in the forest understand each other. The dangers there are familiar friends, and the things that would send you scurrying to your bed are respected. Tolls are paid, covenants made. The foreboding forest is a stern mother, but she only punishes those who deserve it. No, it is in the silence when the forest turns its face away. That is when you are lost. Ah, I love it. I love it so much. Thank it. you. <laughs> oh, Ren, that was fantastic. I love it. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh my gosh. So <laughs> thank you so much for reading that for us. So you are definitely inspired by campfires. Yes. Very, very <laughs> yes, much so. Yes. 
<laughs> very much so. Okay, so why don't you pick someone from the audience and yeah. our winner? Uh, how do I see? Let's see. Okay, um, let's go with I Sam Habab. I Sam Habab. Awesome. Yay. So to win your copy of Wirewing, either DM Parliament Books with Attention Marketing, which is me, or email marketing at parliamenthousepress.com. And I'll make sure to get that ebook copy to you right away. Follow Ren on social media. Ren, where can they find you? I'm the most acti active on Facebook. You can just look Ren Hanman. I'm the only one. I'm also on Twitter, uh, Instagram, TikTok. Uh, Sings the Ren is my Instagram handle. So you can pretty much find me lurking anywhere you like to lurk on the internet. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, well, you are just fantastic. Every time I get to do a live with you, I think you're just the sweetest person ever. Thank so, you so much. Uh, I just love you to pieces. Well, enjoy your holiday, my dear, and have a happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Bye. Bye. Hi, everybody. I'm Lila Lawson, and I am here with Halloween Heart Stories, where we read short fiction from Parliament House authors, of which I am one. My story, just like last year, is a short based on the book Dead Rock Star, which is, this is the first in a trilogy with the second book titled The Wolf Den coming out on 2 22 so early next year. It's already up for pre-order, so please take advantage of that. Um, this story does uh, feature Philip DeVille and Stormy Spooner, who are my two main heroines. And yeah, it's called House of Mirrors, and I'm going to read it to you now off my computer, so if it looks a little awkward, my apologies. <laughs> House of Mirrors, a dead rock star story. If it was possible to pout and shove funnel cake into your mouth at the same time, I was definitely doing that. I've been looking forward to bringing my undead boyfriend, Philip DeVille, to the annual fall fair for weeks, dreaming about ramming him in bumper cars, then pulling him onto the Ferris wheel where we take in a beautiful nighttime view before stealing a few steamy kisses. An hour had passed and all my friends were here. Lee and Benny, Roberta, Jamie, Nikolai, even Clara. But no Philip. Where was he? He'll be here, a kind voice said. I turned as Roberta looped her arm through mine. Come on, let's check out the fun house. I opened my mouth to protest that I hated the fun house, but it was full of funnel cake and therefore useless. But inside, I gaped. Before me, there was a hall of mirrors, rippling and flimsy, childlike, but the room was oddly devoid of air, hot and stifling and creepy. I inched forward, ramming my head into a mirror. I turned and walked straight into another one. Okay, I already hate this. I moved forward, hoping it was in the right direction, but just as I turned a corner, arms grabbed me and pulled me backwards, a large, strong hand stifling my scream. I kicked my legs as I was dragged past the shimmering, wobbly mirrors towards the back exit. I could see the reflection of the blinking sign looming behind me. I tried to bite the hand, but it held me fast. The door opened and I was pulled out, down the steps, and hoisted over shoulders that were impossible to escape from. I yelled for Roberta, but then I heard a familiar laughter. Black hair fell down, tickling my face as I turned to see Philip. He held me over his shoulder with one arm easily, as if I were a sack of potatoes. His mouth turned up at the corners. Sorry I'm late, he said, but I hoped you liked my dramatic entrance. I began to protest, but he clamped his hand over my mouth again and walked with purpose to the Ferris wheel, me still dangling over his shoulder, but no longer protesting. So that's my story. I hope you liked it. <laughs> I really enjoy doing flash fiction with these characters because I love to revisit them. I have, I have a much love for them. <laughs> um, and if you recognized or didn't recognize a few names uh, that are featured, just know that this story takes place between Dead Rock Star and The Wolf Den, which is coming out early next year. So you're going to meet a whole new cast of characters that hopefully you will fall in love with. And I hope everybody has a wonderful Halloween, a wonderful fall season. And please do check out the other horror stories from some of the other amazing Parliament House authors. And go and check out um, some of the sales that Parliament House has going on with some of these amazing titles. You definitely want to do that. So... Have a great day. Bye, everybody. Hello there again. Welcome back to Halloween Hearthside Stories with Parliament House Press. I am Jennifer Sidaway, the host of this event. 
Uh, before we dive into our next author, I want to apologize for those of you who tried to log in at 7.30. We were having a little bit of technical difficulties and we will be posting that author's reading as soon as we can. We are about to hear from Miss Carla Lewis, who is the author of the book Zealot and Lineage, which I believe uh, Zealot comes out this following spring. As soon as I see her in the audience, I will invite her to join us. Um, those of you who interact with this post, who comment and watch, will be eligible to win a free copy of her ebook, Lineage. Let's see when she, as soon as I see her, I will invite her up. Hi Marlena, how are you? There is Carla. Let me invite her to join us. Hi, Carla. How are you? Hi. I have my co-host with me. This is Harvey. <laughs> yeah, I like your spooky eyes. Yeah, I have in these red contacts, which are kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> so um, before I uh, brought you up, I was telling our viewers that if they comment and interact with this post, they are eligible to win an ebook copy of your book lineage. Yeah. So after you finish reading, I was going to let you select someone from the audience and we can announce the winner. How does that sound? That sounds good. Great. Well, tell us a little bit about your story. Okay. So it's titled she, and, um, like I told everybody last Friday, this is the story of what happened to that, yacht that was found off the coast of Tulare Island, my fictional uh, island in the right. story. So, yeah, it's, <laughs> Marlena read it. I see she's, she's on there. Hi, Marlena. Um, but yeah, she read it and she helped me with it. So, yeah, that's what it's about. It's I what see. happened to the people who were supposed to be on board. <laughs> so. Oh gosh, I, I can't wait. Okay. You want me to start now? Absolutely. Let's dive right okay. in. Okay. I'm going to be looking down. I'm sorry. Um, okay. So she, uh, my skin glowed with a luminescence that came from within. It felt like my veins had been replaced with live wire. I studied my once light brown complexion in the long mirror in my killer's, my husband's dearest friend room. Joseph locked me in the cabin of his yacht, Ilsa Sea, while he sat moored off the shores of Tulare Island, waiting for his guests to arrive. Everything from the overly large bed that sat upon a white marble dais adorned in gold velvet to the clawfoot tub with gilded fixtures seemed to be from another time and place, just like the ball gown he wished me to wear. None of it felt real. I turned my head to the side to better study my neck. Not a single bruise marred its smooth surface. How had he managed to remove the bruises his hands would have made when he took the life out of me? But then again, how had he managed to raise me from the dead? In the mirror's reflection, I stared at the door opening behind me. Joseph walked in, his dark brown eyes roaming hungrily over me as his nostrils flared. Why aren't you dressed? He asked, demanding. When I didn't answer, he stormed over, snatching the red velvet dress from the bed. Gold embroidery had been stitched into the bodice of the gown. The stitching looked like marionette strings. Put this on before my guests arrive. I lifted my chin. I will not. His hand was like lightning, the sound like thunder as he struck me. I stumbled back, falling against the vanity. You are mine to command, to control. You will do as I say. I am your master now. His words raked across my skin. I did not belong to this man. Rage bubbled to the surface, and my hand gripped the scissors behind me. A smile spread across my face. By his expression, he believed my smile was for him until I buried the scissors in his neck, blood running down his gold jacket. I turned away and picked up the dress. Maybe I would put it on and wait for his friends to arrive. Oh, so good. <laughs> Thank you. So good. Thank you, Carla. <laughs> You gave me goosebumps. Like she stabs him in the neck with scissors. Just like, 
<laughs> yeah, he killed her, brought her back to life. So, yeah, oh, he thought he could control her, and that was that was wrong. <laughs> yeah, and when you're describing that dress, like that, it was like marionette strings. Like, oh, that, <laughs> that is a trigger. That is poetry. Good job. <laughs> that is so good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. Yeah. Hi, Shane. Hi, Marlena. Hi. Um, so talk to us a little bit about the book that this comes from, because this is a little excerpt from a larger work. Did, is there anything about Zealot or Lineage that you'd like to give us a sneak peek of or just talk to us about the world building that you've done there? Well, Zealot, um, I mentioned this, this, this yacht in passing, my, my, my main character, Nicole, mentions it because when she was younger, her and her friends, when they were teenagers, you know, they, they developed a uh, ghost tour on this yacht because, yeah, it was found, blood all over the place, nobody on board. And so Nicole and her friends went to go disprove that ghosts were real and got kicked off the, you know, the tour, of course, but she mentioned it in there. And so I said, wouldn't it be neat if we found out what actually happened? And so... I, I wasn't planning to, but I am going to have she show up again in the series at some point because she is undead. So I, I am going to have her show up. Oh, my gosh. Please do. Please <laughs> do. Absolutely. Like, I, there is so much potential for you to expand on this story. I would love that so, so much. Yeah. Thank you. Marlena told me she wants me to write a series. <laughs> Yeah, like, yeah, girl. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, that's what it's from. It's just, it's something in passing, but I said, you know what? I'm going to have to put her in the series somewhere, so. Yeah, sometimes characters speak to us, and they just, they need their stories told. That's and, true. And she is fantastic. I can't wait, wait to find out what her name is. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah. well, I think um, let's see, we got into quite a few things during our interview last week. We were talking about, you know, what makes a monster. Um, mm -hmm. For those of us who didn't get to uh, watch your interview, do you mind sharing with us what you think makes a good monster and what effect spooky scenery has on the thriller and horror genre? Um, like I said, what makes a monster is the lack of humanity. Like... Yeah. You can turn someone into a vampire, a werewolf, a zombie, anything. And if originally they had that compassion for humanity in them, chances are they will fight that compulsion to just wildly kill people. So the lack of humanity and then turning someone into a vampire, a werewolf, or anything, any kind of creature, means that they're just going to kill at wild abandon and have absolutely no shame in doing so so i think that's the component that makes a monster because you can turn somebody into anything but it's that that makes a monster yeah i've got to agree with you there mm -hmm. all right well let's look in in the comment section i don't know who's all in there because i can yeah, barely I see, I see shane and marlena and i see a few other people um how about we leave the chat open until tomorrow morning and we will post the winner in the comments around 10 tomorrow morning. How does that sound? Jamie. Jamie, Jamie. reads everything? Yeah, because she, she wants to read everything. So, yes. All <laughs> She's right. <the> one. <laughs> Jamie reads everything. Congratulations. You won an ebook copy of Carla's book. Um, Either DM us at Parliament Books or you can email marketing at parliamenthousepress.com and I will make sure to get those assets to you right away. Carla, I hope you have a wonderful spooky season and Thank you. Happy, you too. happy Halloween. You too. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Hello and welcome to Hearthside Stories from the Parliament House. You are hearing from a number of my Parliament House publishing siblings um, throughout the course of this series and they are spooky and wonderful and 
I'm, um, I'm a little bit different. <laughs> I lean more to the deranged side of things. So I have um, poured myself a um, uh, zombie dust undead pale ale to celebrate, and I'm going to read you a story that I wrote. It is a tie-in with my Parliament House title, Double Crossing the Bridge, which is the story of a group of grog-chugging trolls who pulls a heist on the evil corporation, The Covered Bridge. Um, I say it's for children the same way that Deadpool is. Um, the story that I wrote um, for this series is another take on my opening. And the opening of my book starts with a terrified rat running for cover as a group of drunk trolls and swags, which are basically um, oversized flying pigs, play a game of Critter Hole. And Critter Hole is just like Cornhole. If you're in the South, you know what that is. If not, perhaps you don't. But it is a game where you throw bean bags into a hole in a platform. In this case, there's a spike waiting in the hole. So without further ado, go ahead and Fill up your drink, and I will um, read to you the story called Hole in One. Dave gnaws on my tail while a hedgehog cries in the corner. I don't know if it's a nervous habit or if he's finally cracked. Dim green light filters into our slotted crate, but we can't make out much of the cavern beyond. All we hear is the riotous laughter of trolls, and swags drinking away their afternoon. Dave, knock it off, I squeal. Dave's whiskers twitch and his eyes roll around unfocused and wild. Cracked then. The biting stops. The green light blinks out, eclipsed by a fleshy hand, twice the size of any one of us. It smells of grog, fried fairy wings, and something wholly organic. My insides quiver with a threat of evacuation. I flatten my body so my fur isn't the first those stubby fingers encounter. Who will it be? The hedgehog or my ex-roommate? The rat I've looked up to since enrolling in Squeak U. I smirk with the realization that being tight with the cheesy Epsilon sorority doesn't do Dave any good now. The fat hand closes around his thrashing body. See you in the afterlife, buddy. Dave's screams make one thing clear. I've got to get out of here. The hedgehog is now a quivering ball of quills. Without thinking, I scale her like a metal trash can and reach my paws to the top of the crate. One heave and I'm over. I land hard, but I don't have time to sulk. Hey, the ball is getting away. The voice like thunder reverberates off cavern walls and I know I've been spotted. I run for the cover of the mahogany table. A hand, smaller than the first, but no less vile, scoops me up and tosses me to a swag with snot dripping down his wide porcine face. When he catches me, I hear a sickening snap, my ribs splintering between hooves. Now I'm flying. Time slows, and a hush falls over the cavern. The seconds catch up as I fall, my stomach flipping, and chewed up tail fluttering above me toward a wooden platform with the word critter hole displayed in chipped red and yellow paint. I don't hit the platform. Instead, I fall through a hole at the center onto a spike, a pile of fur and flesh. Swags rule and trolls drool. The chant ushers me into oblivion. I close my eyes and see Dave. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. Anyway, so if uh, if you enjoy that, something is intensely wrong with you. Also, you should check out my title, Double Crossing the Bridge, with the Parliament House. Thank you, Parliament House, for hosting this. And um, I apologize again. See ya. Hello, and welcome to Halloween Hearth Stories with the Parliament House Press. My name is Jennifer Sidaway, and I'm the host of this year's event. Every night this week, we're going to be interviewing authors who will read their short story submissions for this year's event. I see our current author in the audience. I'm going to invite her up to join me. It should just take one second. Hi, 
Hi there. Oh, how are you tonight? I'm fantastic. How are you, Nicole? I'm good. I'm on time today. <laughs> <laughs> I am not worried. I have a co-host. I've been accusing him. His name is Harvey. Look, I have a matching one. Nice. He doesn't, he doesn't have a name, though. He doesn't have a name. No, he doesn't have a name. He's so cute, though. We should give him one. I think so. What should we name him? Hmm. I don't know. I'll think about that. I'll think about it. Sounds good. Sounds good. <laughs> okay, for those who were not able to tune in and watch your interview, why don't you introduce yourself and just tell them a little bit about what you've written for Broadway Pass. All right. Hi, my name's Nicole Knapp. Um, I'm the author of the Hook and Crown series. Uh, it's a duology, a dark retelling of Peter Pan. And, and the cover is amazing. If you haven't it seen is. the cover, it is absolutely it is. stunning. It's incredible. I actually just ordered it for myself off Amazon, so I'll have to <laughs> let you know once I have finished. Yes, I would love to hear your thoughts. Oh, I'm sure I'm going to love it. Anything with Captain Hook is like right up my alley, 100%. <laughs> okay. Agreed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so tell us about um, the story that we're about to hear. Is it based on one of your published works or is this a standalone? Um, it's just a standalone. I, when I do these flash fiction like this, I like to come up with just something completely on their own. Awesome. So it, it's brand new. That's so much fun. I love that. Okay, well, I guess I'm going to turn over the time and let's hear your short story. This is going to be fantastic. All right, here we go. Uh, my story this year is called The Imaginary Friend, and it goes like this. I do so need a sandwich for Mr. Sprinkles, I demand. My mother looks at me from her place at the sink, sets down the plate she was washing, and sighs loudly. I thought we were done with the Mr. Sprinkles thing. You're getting a bit old for an imaginary friend. He's not imaginary, I shout. He's real, and he lives in the basement. My mother sighs again, defeatedly, then drops her hands and gets the bread back out. Fine, but this is the last time. I can't stop the smile that spreads across my face. Bouncing on my toes, I wait for her to finish. When she turns, I snatch the sandwich from her, sprint away down the stairs into the basement. Mr. Sprinkles, I call out, lunch is ready, but he doesn't show himself. Just when I'm starting to worry that my mother scared him away, I turn and, oh, there you are. Mr. Sprinkles smiles down at me. Today he is wearing a green shirt that matches his eyes and brown pants that are too short. I hate my mom, I say between bites. She never believes me about anything. And she said I can't bring you food anymore. Mr. Sprinkles finishes his sandwich, licking the peanut butter from his thumb. What if... He says thoughtfully, I told you I could take care of her for you. Then it could be just you and me, kid. I wouldn't have to hide in this basement anymore. Finishing my own lunch, I consider my friend's offer. Could you really? Sure, kid. Just meet me down here after she's asleep and I'll handle it. Easy peasy, he says with a wink. I don't think I've ever smiled so big before. Late at night, I tiptoe through the house, back to the basement where Mr. Sprinkles is waiting. Then together, we creep quietly to my mom's room. He signals for me to wait, then pushes open the door and slips inside. Who the hell are you? I hear my mom shout. You can just call me Mr. Sprinkles, ma'am, my friend replies. A few minutes later, my friend opens the door and walks past me with my mother, wrapped in her sheets, slung over his shoulder. See, I say as he carries her to the backyard. Told you he was real. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Nicole, you've ruined me. <laughs> no, thank I'm, you. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> sorry, but I'm not sorry at the same time. <laughs> oh my gosh. Did anyone else get John Wayne Gacy vibes? Like the creepy um, ugh, serial killer that preyed on young boys? Ugh, awful. Awful. <laughs> You're a beautiful literary monster, and I love you. <laughs> Please don't ever stop. <laughs> 
I will take that compliment. You're going to make me cry. <laughs> like, seriously, like, I don't know, you were reading, I don't know if you could tell, I was like, no, 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 that's, that's nope. Don't go into the basement. That is, that is not the place for you. That's why, that's why when we talked about last week, like what makes a monster, I, I made sure to point out, it doesn't have to be supernatural. Humans can be monsters too. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there's something just so unsettling about like a child only seeing the truth. And, and that goes back to Peter Pan too, with like Hook that like, they know what's going on and then nobody's that. listening to them. Like, <laughs> I've been telling you, this was what was happening. Right, and, maybe, maybe if oh. she just went down in the basement more often, she would <laughs> No, no, thank you. Alrighty, well, now that I have, you know, confirmed that I will not be sleeping tonight, um, <laughs> <laughs> we are going to select someone from the audience and they are going to win a free ebook copy of Hook and Crown. Oh, okay. How does that so, sound? So I was going to let you look through the audience, pick a name at random, and that is who we will send the book to. Okay, so let's go with Life by Mindy Lee. Life by Mindy Lee. Awesome. Thank you so much for watching Nicole's live reading. Um, please feel free to either private message Parliament Books or you can email marketing at parliamenthousepress.com and I will make sure to get that book out to you. So Nicole, before we log off, give us a brief rundown of what you are working on right now. Can we look forward to any books coming out by you in the future? Um, right now, I am actually working on a couple different novels, but I'm doing NaNoWriMo this year, and I'm focused on I'm focused on the one that has caught my attention the most, and I'm hoping I can finish the first draft. So, yeah, NaNoWriMo mm -hmm. is a powerful tool, like especially for getting like the first draft of a manuscript just out there. People who like last can time. Last time I did NaNoWriMo, I wrote Hook and Crown. Nice. So there you go. We'll, we'll see what happens this year. <laughs> it absolutely works. Well, thank you so, so much for joining me. I'm going to save this in IGTV under Parliament's account so you can come back and watch anytime. Okay. Right. Thank you. Happy Halloween. Bye-bye. <laughs> Hello again, and welcome to Halloween Hearth Stories with Parliament House Press. I'm your host, Jennifer Sidaway, and every night this week, we're inviting authors from Parliament House to read their short story entries into this year's little collection of spooky stories that we do. Um, we are about to interview author Danielle Rue. As soon as I see her in the audience, I will invite her up to join us. Cannot wait to hear what she has written. Right there, I see her. I'm going to send the invite. should be joining me any minute. Hi, Danielle. Hi. How are you? Good. Thanks for joining me and happy early Halloween. Yes, happy Halloween. <laughs> so for anyone who wasn't able to watch your interview, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you've written in the past? Um, so I've written a young adult series that is a spooky, psychic, sort of dystopian series um, called the Shades of the City series. And the third book in the series is coming out on um, in April. So uh, and it is called A King and a Monster. Uh, it's a sort of a group of psychic queer kids who go out and try to figure out the secrets of the city what's happening and it's uh very political and stabby and also fun and weird so yay <laughs> i love that description it's very political and stabby that <laughs> very click and dagger I love yes that. there's a lot of like who's doing this what's that all that and then i also wrote a novel uh, my first one, which is August Prather is Not Dead Yet, which is more of a road trip summer novel, but it also is kind of spooky and weird. <laughs> it's like what I write, you know? So. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> well, for those of you who don't know, 
if you comment on this post, follow it, like it, um, you'll be entered to win a free ebook copy of Shades of the City by Danielle Rue. Um, I'm going to hand over the time and let's hear your spooky short story. Okay. This is called A Ghost in the House. Mm. Things kept disappearing. Small things at first. A sewing needle. A blue pattern teacup. Her favorite gray ribbon. Never where she left them and never to be found. Then, larger, more important objects began to vanish. A poetry book gifted by a dear friend, a stack of old love letters she had been told to burn, the most recent draft of her manuscript. She began to wonder if she was losing her mind. Her mother went mad and was sent away when she was a child. But madness doesn't cause things that once existed to stop existing, does it? One fall evening, the air cold and brittle, she heard a faint voice call her name, Emily. A steady, distant tone, speaking a string of jumbled words, she rose from her writing desk and crept down the stairs, following the sound to the front parlor. Emily. Entering the room, she was confronted with an unexpected crowd of people. Strangers standing in the center of the floor with their backs turned to her, all dressed in odd, brightly colored costumes. Before them stood a woman dressed in a short pink shift dress and published eight volumes of poetry. After her lover left her, Emily lived here alone until she died. Any questions? The oddly dressed woman asked. One of the strangers, a pretty young woman with bright blue hair, turned to look back. Emily met her piercing gaze, unsure what to say or do. After a moment that felt like a lifetime, the girl looked away. Something wrong? Another member of the crowd asked. Nothing, the blue haired girl said. Just thought I saw a ghost. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> you're killing me here. That was fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much, Danielle. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> yeah, I I definitely see elements of Poe in your work. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I love it so much. <laughs> okay, so what inspired you to write that? Um, so I used to do a lot of work with museums. And it always made me think, like, what would the people who lived here think if, like, they could see us now touring their house and, like, looking through all their stuff? Um, yeah, that, what, a, what if the audience just said, was this influenced by your ghost tour guide days? Yeah, I used to give ghost tours. And I used to do, like, house museum tours, too. So it's sort of like that. Like, imagine there's sort of like a, like, not exactly time travel, but like a, you're a ghost, but you don't realize you're a ghost kind of element to it. But oh, I think yeah. it's kind of fun to play with. So yeah, like what if the, the person who used to live in the house was haunting it and didn't realize they were dead and was like, what, what are all these creepy people doing in my house? Yeah, why do, why do people keep bugging me? <laughs> and taking my stuff. <laughs> yeah, things keep disappearing. Right? What the heck? <laughs> Wow. Well, <laughs> I, I, I told Nicole, I didn't need to sleep tonight. That's, it's fine. This is fine. Everything's fine. <sighs> well, thank you so much for sharing your short story with us. Yeah. And we, we can look forward to A King and a Monster, and that comes out in April, you said? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Um, was there anything else you wanted to um, share with our viewership before we pick a winner from the audience? No, I think it's good. I think thank you all for watching and I hope you enjoy the spooky. <laughs> These are so much fun. I am i can't even tell you how much I enjoy this <laughs> event and hearing these spooky stories, it definitely gets you in the mood for Halloween. Yeah, it's wonderful. <laughs> Best time of the year. All right, well, let's look into the audience and I will let you select someone to win a copy of Shades of the City. Okay. Let's see. How should I do it? Hello, 
let's have um, Lady Azeroth 83 win. Lady Azeroth 83, congratulations. <laughs> I will um, look forward to receiving a DM. Like you can either message Parliament Books or you can email marketing at parliamenthousepress.com. That is me. And I will make sure that that book gets to you safe and sound. Danielle is a fantastic writer and I am just sure that you will love it. Aww, thank you. All right. Yay. Well, thank you, Danielle. Have a wonderful, spooky season. And happy Halloween. <laughs> happy Halloween. Bye-bye. Hello and good evening. Welcome to another episode of Halloween Hearth Stories with Parliament House Press. I am the host, Jennifer Sidaway, and every night this week we'll be joining Parliament authors to read their spooky short story submissions to this year's event. I'm going to invite one of our authors up onto the stage to read story. I don't know why they call it inviting them up onto the stage, but it is my understanding that's what it's called. <laughs> Hi, Hi, how are you? I'm doing good. How about you? I am excellent. That's great. Uh, for those in the audience who are not able to watch your interview, can you introduce yourself and tell them what you've written? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm E.M. Wright, um, also known as M. Um, I wrote a Sedition, um, a YA steampunk novel published with Parliament Books last May. Um, and I have a little short coming from the same world tonight to share with you. Excellent. And um, during our interview, we talked a little bit about what makes a monster. Mm -hmm. Do you want to touch on that for a second? Because I thought that was a really interesting topic personally yeah um i really like to play with the concepts of what society uh, might call a monster within um people um and so any kind of person who might be different or someone that society doesn't consider to be um the norm um can easily be turned into a monster um and i like to look at that and then sort of see um, what that character chooses to do with that label. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, you've got, um, in our interview, we talked about the character Elphaba in The mm -hmm. Wizard of Oz, who's just like, you want to call me a witch? Fine, I'm a bad witch, and I will be the baddest witch on the, like you've ever heard of. Yeah. And then there's people who just, you know, are kind of a tragic character who just, like, try so hard to be kind and... They're just never accepted. And that, those are always the heartbreaking ones. But yeah. they are both monsters. And then you have the psychological, just like insane monsters. Yes. Alrighty. So what we have been doing this week, Emily, is giving a free ebook for people who are in the audience who comment, who like, and share this post. So if you comment, like, um, you will be eligible to win a copy of Emily's book, Sedition. And after we've done our little reading, I'm going to let you pick somebody from the audience and we'll uh, pick a winner together. All right. Awesome. All right. The stage is yours. Okay. Um, so this short is called A Night at the Elves. The smell of blood and sweat ran thickly through the air, accompanied by the screaming crowd and the murmur of rain on the leaky roof. A normal Saturday night at the Elves then. The textiles warehouse on London's outskirts hadn't sold a bolt of silk or bundle of cotton in years, but they dealt in a different fiber, flesh, or rather flesh laced with wires and gears, biomatons built and trained for one thing, to fight. And tonight was unique, tonight was special, because tonight the elves introduced a new fighter to the ring. The crowd had murmured about the main event all night, whispered rumors traveling from sailor to sea captain, from merchant to aristocrat. They said the new fighter had weapons unlike any the elves had seen. They said he was more monster than man. They said he drank the blood of his opponents and spoke in the language of devils. No one knew his background. Only the managers of the fighting ring had seen the biomaton to preserve the mystery. With a splatter of blood and a cry from the audience, the fight came to an end and it was time. 
The crowd stirred as the announcer entered the ring, introducing the current champion, a massive biomaton known only as the Destroyer, one arm replaced with a massive clockwork battering ram. And then the new biomaton stepped into the ring and the room went deathly silent. The tall young man was muscular, with long black hair pulled back from his face with a ribbon. His dark skin glistened in the lamplight and his green eyes seemed almost gentle. But that was where his humanity stopped. A set of massive clockwork wings rose behind him, spreading dozens of wickedly sharp bladed feathers. The announcer left the ring, and the newcomer gave his opponent a cold smile, revealing a set of silver fangs. As one, the crowd leaned forward, breaths held, waiting for the bell to ring and commence the fight. They'd come to see a bloodbath, and Seraphim, the angel of death, promised to deliver. Jeez. Yeah! <laughs> That'll do. That'll do. <laughs> That'll do. Oh man. Like what a killer like last line. Thank you. I Chef's kiss. Just Again. Yeah. Um yeah, so your, the world you have created is a, um, it's an alternative version of Victorian London. Mm -hmm. So this would be taking place in that same, in that same universe where some of the people who have undergone surgery to get a prosthetic due to medical reasons or whatever, they're treated as, as slaves, they're less than. Mm -hmm. And so when you refer to a biomaton, that is what you are referring to. Yes, they're basically clockwork cyborgs. That's how I usually explain it. Yeah, yeah, except, um, or that's how they're viewed, but not all of them are, like your heroine in Sedition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so she's built differently, I guess. You could yeah, say. So, yeah, I have the, the idea of a just gladiators in general it was such a barbaric practice mm -hmm. and then like forcing uh biomatons to go through that is a very intriguing subject very intriguing yeah that's cool i'm that's not gonna make me think like the whole rest of the week <sighs> like one of the things i love about your work emily is that it's it sticks with you after the fact it makes you like after i read sedition like a month later i was still thinking about it i was still thinking about taryn and like how she dealt with the situation she was thrown into and so now i'm like emily you have to finish this short story <laughs> like i need to know what happens here <laughs> so you get a little bit more of this character in the sequel and get, get to learn a little bit more about this whole thing. So it is coming. <laughs> nice. Okay, well, let's, um, let's pick a winner from the audience. Let's see who's down there. Yeah. And they're going to get a co uh, ebook copy of your book, Sedition. All right. I'm seeing this. Um... So I've seen two, seen two comments. Has anyone else commented or? I haven't seen anyone else commenting, but those, that's still two comments. You, uh, <laughs> I know those two already have copies of my book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you just want to pick another uh, viewer at random? Yeah. Um, let's go with um, JC Sellers. JC Sellers, congratulations. You want a copy of Emily's book, Sedition. You can either private message Parliament Books and we'll make sure we get those assets out to you. Or you can email marketing at parliamenthousepress.com. And that's me. I'll make sure that book gets out to you. Thank you, Emily, so much for joining me this evening for Halloween Hearth Stories. Yeah, this has been lovely. Thanks for joining me. Have a lovely spooky season. Yeah. And, 
and readers check back because Emily has uh, other books in the work and we'll be posting about them as they become available. Yes. Yeah, we will. <laughs> All right. All right. Yes. Have a great night. See you too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Hey there, welcome to another evening of Halloween Hearthside Stories with Parliament House Press. My name is Jennifer Sidway. I am the host for the evening. Um, we're going to have Vicki Ann Bush, the author of the Alex McKenna series, joining us. I see her in the audience. I'm going to invite her up to join. Chizuki short story that she has submitted for this year's Halloween Hearthside event. Hi, Vicki Ann. Hi. <laughs> Woo, I love the contacts. <laughs> Thank you. You look very spooky. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm in the spirit. I love this holiday. Oh my gosh. It is the absolute best. You may, did, I don't know if you saw me last night, but I had my blackout contacts in as well. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I can see it when you have your eyes, like open your eyes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So for... The people in the audience who weren't able to watch your interview, do you mind introducing yourself and telling them what you have written in the past? No, not at all. I'm Vicki Ann Bush. I write young adult paranormal and paranormal romance. Um, my latest series is Alex McKenna with the Parliament House. And I'm super excited because the third book is coming out in December. That's right. And then the fourth book comes out in 2022, correct? Yeah, sometime in 2022. Yeah. Well, excellent. Do you want to tell us about Alex McKenna while we have you? Alex is um, a little bit different than what I normally write in a sense that, yes, it's paranormal, but Alex is a 17-year-old transgender boy. So the idea is to bring the character into the reader's, um, you know, on the reader's journey, but it's not focused on the parent, um, the transgender, it's focused on the paranormal, so that you get things sprinkled in, you know, so the reader is aware, but this is not what the story's about. Yeah, I think it's important to have that diversity and the representation seen in literature. So, bravo, Vicki Ann. I cannot wait to read it. I'm gonna, I haven't read Alex McKenna yet, but it is on my to be read list. And hopefully I will be picking it up any day now. Well, if you're anything like me, your to be read is like miles long and you try oh, yeah. to get, you, know, <laughs> you try to get through it. And ever growing. Mm-hmm. Because there's happy. always something interesting out there. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, something new. <laughs> Okay, so you wrote a spooky short story. Is this based off one of your established works or is this a standalone? It's actually based off of the character through the Alex McKenna series that the reader never sees. So they communicate, Alex communicates with this particular ghost, demon, because you're not sure exactly what Victor is, um, through, um, they talk through, through mind. So, um, he's not he's just a very in the shadows character nice well i can't wait to hear it um with that in mind i'm going to hand the microphone over the proverbial microphone and let's dive right in okay and this is victor victor waited his long bony fingers dripping with anticipation trepidation the boy who'd plagued his existence since the child was old enough to speak was winding down. Like a clock whose battery was slowly draining, the time had finally come when the boy, now a man, would leave the world of breathers and be an eternal resident of the world beyond flesh and blood. The ominous being that Victor had been for several millennia was about to meet his demise at the hands of the one he'd feared for so long. Alex had promised that if Victor ever deceived him, caused him to lose someone he loved, that he'd seek revenge. It had been years since his treachery had done just that, and now the great Alex McKenna would fulfill his vow. But once he saw the true nature of the unseen force he conferred with for so many cases, would he still want to end his existence for eternity? 
or will he understand the true nature of Victor and the reason he had to do what he did? The breath was flowing, his beloved Margaret at Alex's side. Victor's worry escalated to sheer terror. He was slipping, and the last thing his unconscious mind had shouted was the promise he'd made to Victor. A reenactment of the day the being had stolen a piece of the witch's heart, leaving a black patch in its void. The two hadn't spoken in 20 years until last week when Alex knew his time was over. He reached out for his old foe, promising he'd see him soon. Victor knew there were fates worse than obliteration, worse than the depths of hell with Lucifer, and he was sure Alex had his reserved. A soft voice whispered in his ear, hello, Victor. <laughs> Wrong one. I was not ready for the feels. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. That is a complicated relationship, too. Mm -hmm. Very. <laughs> they do. They really do. Oh my gosh. So, so what inspired you to write this short story? Um, you know, it's funny because I've written the character in all the books. Mm -hmm. I still don't have a clear picture in my own mind of who Victor is and what he looks like. His voice is the only thing that rings in my head. And so when I found out that we were gonna be doing this, you know, and I wanted to participate, he seemed like the perfect character because he is so dark. And yet there's so many times he helped Alex during the books. You know it's self-reliance, I mean self-centered that he yeah. does this because he doesn't want he doesn't want Alex to, to die, but um, it's just, I don't know, he's a mystery, and, and that intrigued me. Yeah, it's doing the right thing for the wrong reasons. <laughs> That's exactly him, yes. Yeah. Oh or God. is it, though? Or is it? I don't know. Is it true? Yeah, there's definitely layers to that kind of a character. That's really interesting. Maybe you should uh, dive into that a little bit deeper because, like, this scene, like, I'm waiting for more. <laughs> like, I'm ready for another chapter. Thank you. No, it's fantastic. Thank you so much. And thank you for participating in Halloween Heart Stories. Um, we are going to be giving away an ebook copy of Alex McKenna book one. I had to think for a minute. Is it the Academy of Souls? Is that book one? Uh, the Geranium Desk. And the geranium deaths. So we're going to pick somebody from the audience or who has watched while we were talking and we will message them and I'm going to make sure that book gets into the right hands. Sounds good. All right. Do you want me, so, to, do you want me to pick or do you, let's let you do it? Um, I only see it. <laughs> These lenses are <laughs> difficult to see sometimes on a screen. <laughs> But I see only Jeffy. Can you read that? Jeffy. That's one. Yeah. Only Jeffy. Um, <laughs> feel free to, to private message Parliament Books and that you'll get in touch with me. Or you can email marketing at parliamenthousepress.com. And I will make sure that we get that ebook copy to you. Make sure you follow Vicki Ann on social media. Where can they find you? Vicky You're Ann? welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome, Holly Jeffrey. Where can they find you? Um, they can find me, of course, on Parliament House on, on the web page and also my own at VickiAnnBush.com and on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Do you have a around the block at the coffee shop? Um, <laughs> do you have a social that you're more active on than others? Yeah, yeah I tend to be a little more active on Instagram and Twitter okay. than the other ones. Yeah. Okay, so find Vicky Ann's handle, follow her. She puts out great stuff, and keep your eyes peeled for a new book coming out in December. Thank you. Thank you. I see that. <laughs> All right, have a great night and happy Halloween. You too. <laughs> Bye. The bar guest grows ahead by Amy Finlayson. Tom and Eric pick their way along the hardened track towards the dim lights of the inn while the mists wreathed around them thick and heavy 
as though the clouds themselves clung to the earth to escape the cold of the endless black sky. The wind roared and ripped over the moors, assaulting their ears, but it was the sound of metal chains that filled their hearts with fear. They were everywhere. The men twisted and turned, searching the shroud, when out of it stepped a monster. A coal-black headless beast padded over the thick bracken, rough claws gouged furrows in the ice-hard dirt, and the chain circling its empty neck dragged between powerful legs. A pulsing circle of horror sat where the head should have been, twitching nerves and white bones flashing like teeth. The muscles of the beast glistened as it moved towards the men. Then it leapt. There were no screams. There was no time. The headless monster ripped the throats from the two men, then bent to feed, the open neck moving over their remains until a violent spasm rippled through its body. It crashed through the bracken, spreading bloody mess across the frosted grass as it thrashed. The legs quivered, and the body shook. The nerves, muscles, and sinews in the neck moved and pulsed as the bones stretched and grew. The beast writhed and flailed, the heavy chain shattering the high moors, but it was nothing to the noise that followed. A mournful, low growl built and stretched and lifted to a rising howl as the monstrous head twitched and snapped violently into place. The beast stood, panting and snarling on the dark, bloody path. It raised its muzzle, opened its jaw, tasting the air for the first time. Then it ran. Hello and good evening. Welcome to another installment of Halloween Hearth Stories with Parliament House Press. My name is Jennifer Sidaway. I am the host of this year's event. Um, if you're just tuning in for the first time, every night this week we've been having a Parliament author join us and read their short spooky story submission for this year's, um, not really a competition, just kind of a, a fun writing project that we've been doing. I'm going to invite Marlena Frank up onto the stage. She should be joining me in just a second. Hi! Hey! I love your costume. Thank you, thank you. I had a good time putting it together. I saw your red contacts the other day when you were interviewing Carla, and I was like, I want to do that. <laughs> They're pretty fun. I was worried that they would impede my vision, but they haven't at all. Yeah, they're great. I just can't read very well with them in, so it's all of yeah, mine have no description. <laughs> I, I'd be the only vampire with glasses. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you do, right? <laughs> Isn't the, like, eternal life supposed to come with benefits? <laughs> right? You're like, come on now. <laughs> this could be fixed. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I wanted to give you just a few minutes to talk about your writing and sure. what, you, what you published. And basically just introduce yourself to our viewership. Sure, uh, my name is Marlena Frank and I'm a young adult fantasy and horror author. Um, tonight, the story I'm gonna be reading is set in the world of The Sea King and uh, of course, you know, shameless plug with that. <laughs> uh, it's, it's such a gorgeous cover. It's absolutely Right, beautiful. right. And I, I love all of the, like the eyes for all the little monsters and stuff. Oh yeah, like I, I can't help but look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's me watching horror movies. <laughs> Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I am I am such a wuss when it comes to horror. I will look up like plot spoilers intentionally. Just yeah. like, okay, okay. So you know what's coming. <laughs> <laughs> I know what I'm in for. I can expect the jump scare. <laughs> right, right. And I, I, I love watching horror and I love writing horror, but I'm always like watching it like this, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So one of the questions I was asking authors during the interviews that um, I just wanted to give you the opportunity to answer is, sure. what do you think makes a really good monster? Like a really scary bad guy? Um, personally, I think what makes a scary bad guy monster, you know, some kind of entity is when um, it has facets of things that people really fear. Um, mm -hmm. Like, it doesn't matter how abstract they are, as long as there's some, like, glimmer of something that is some true terror that people can have. Um, for example, the, the gray people in this are pretty terrifying. They're the, quote, nice, the nice monsters are different from the other monsters that live in the woods. And I feel like um, I, I was inspired by that through a nightmare that I had, and I woke up and I was like, oh, I gotta write this down. <laughs> but then mm -hmm. it comes from you know, fears of, of, you know, 
you know, I've been out, I go, used to go out in the woods all the time when I was a kid and would just wander through the forest and stuff. And there's always this worry of like, is someone like watching me? Am I being watched by something or someone that I yeah. can't see? And that's like just such a, I think, innate fear um, that, you know, we evolutionarily have <laughs> as human beings. And I, I, that, like, for me, that's what I tapped into for that. But I think some kind of relatable fear is what, is what really brings um, a monster home. <laughs> yeah, I think um, just building on what you said, I think another thing that can make a really scary monster is when you can see that ever so slight glimmer of humanity. Yeah. So you can see that, like, they're relatable. And so you can see something went wrong. <laughs> And you can make that leap that yeah. well, if something went wrong with them. Even if it's like a twisted you. version, you know what I mean? Um, a twisted version of, of humanity or like um, if you're dealing with something that's not even human, um, something that still is a thing that we can grasp onto and be like, that could be a human-isk thing. You know what I mean? So yeah, I definitely agree with you on that. Yeah, sometimes um, I play role-playing games with my husband and yes. our, our friends sometimes and you talk about character alignments right like chaotic good chaotic evil true good true evil things like that and the argument i've heard made a lot is that the difference between a good character quote unquote and a bad character quote unquote they want the same thing it's what they're willing to do to make that happen yeah. that makes them good or evil yeah. like yeah. Uh, like a good person wants that good thing or what they perceive to be good, but they're not willing to like burn a city down to, to make that happen. But they have limits. Bad guy would. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so what, is, what kind of alignment do you usually play as, just out of curiosity? I usually play chaotic good. I'm currently playing an elf barbarian. <laughs> same, <laughs> same, same. Those are my favorite. Oh, tend to be good aligned, but definitely um Leroy Jenkins you know, right <laughs> in, throwing caution to the wind to bash it with a stick right right I'm either uh usually ranger druid some elfish thing so yeah <laughs> <laughs> give me shapeshifters I love those <laughs> so much fun okay well I have taken up enough of your time I'm going to hand over the proverbial microphone and we can dig into your short story. I'm so excited. Okay, uh, so this is Not Too Far, a scene from The Seeking. Henry listened to the laughter from the house as he stepped out into the night. It was too cold for autumn, but a relief from inside. He took a deep breath and realized he was a little drunk, but he had welcomed his baby boy into the world and held him for the first time. Surely a little drink didn't hurt. He stepped farther out, wanting to clear his head. Dad, where are you going? Bisa was in the window, her face filled with concern. She had been by her mother's side all night. At 11 years old, she was more of an adult than he was at that, at that age. <laughs> Just going to take a leak, he said, his words slurring more than he expected. Maybe he was more than a little drunk. Don't go too far, okay? Not too far, sweetie. He waved at her and kept walking. Keep an eye on your brother for me. A father twice over now. How the hell had that happened? It felt like he just blinked and time passed these days and Bisa just turned 11. In a few short years, she would be working and dating too. He frowned at the thought of potential suitors. Was he ready for all of that? No way. He came to a stop and peered down at the glowing dandelions before him. He was at the boundary line. By the grays. He spun around, but there was no sign of the house. He shouldn't be out this far. It was too dangerous. He stepped back and peered into the dark forest ahead of him, realizing that it was far too quiet. He took another step back, tripping and falling on his bum. Was it a creature from the forest? He looked to his feet. No, just a tangle of vines. He sat back and felt relief wash over him, chuckling at his own foolishness. Here he was getting spooked over plants. Maybe Mona was right. Maybe he did need to lay off the booze. Climbing to his feet, he wiped dirt off his rear, then looked once more into the woods. Something was staring back at him with yellow glowing eyes that almost matched the dandelions. It was big, 
far too big to be a gray person. And were those claws its legs? He turned too fast and the world spun, but he pushed through it and ran back the way he came, his breath coming in panicked gasps. Something wrapped around his leg. He pitched forward, but something wrapped around his side and prevented him from hitting the ground. He looked down to see at least a dozen claws wrapped around his torso. He screamed just as something sharp dug deep into his throat, cutting his cry short. Henry Fig was never seen again. Oh, Marlena. <laughs> uh, I thought we were friends. Why are you making me feel all these emotions? <laughs> Oh, and it was like the day of his child's birth. That's yeah. so sad. I know. That makes it so much worse. I know. The whole big family has a very tragic, like, history. And you see in, in The Seeking that Mona is never the same again after all of that. Because she's, <laughs> you know, a widow and has to raise her two kids. And she, like, completely has a mental breakdown and really struggles in a, in a world that's already pretty dangerous. So it's not, not good, not good. But it's a horror novel. So. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Like, as soon as he left the house, I was like, oh, nope, 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 nope. <laughs> Turn around, go back, go home. <laughs> oh, that's... But it's funny. It's, it's funny because, like, when you go wandering, it's kind of in your thoughts. You, you don't realize sometimes. It's like driving on autopilot. You know what I mean? You just, oh, wait. Why am I this far? <laughs> yeah, I now I want to know more about this um, creature, like what attacked him. Like, even if I haven't read your books, that makes me like very curious to find <laughs> out about this universe. Well, it's it's there. I have a, um, I guess you could have an encyclopedia of monsters for this book. So, oh, you know, nice. it's definitely one that you see previously in the book and you kind of don't see it up close, but you do here, unfortunately for Henry. <laughs> that would be such a cool, like, spin-off book to create, like a little um, bestiary with like all the monsters. That would be very cool because I just have like ugly doodles I did of the monsters and it would be oh, really yeah. awesome to have a little companion novella to go with it, you know? That would be so cool. That would be like killer author swag at a signing table. <laughs> I love that <laughs> idea. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, before we let you go, what are you working on currently and what can we look forward to your career in the future? Well, I'm working on um, the Wolves of Canta series, which is about the daughter of a werewolf hunter um, she's helping her father capture a werewolf to bring them in, and um, things go wrong. <laughs> that's She Wolf of Canta, and that's going to be coming out. It's a re release of a novella that I wrote years ago, but I've added additional scenes. It's got a beautiful new cover, um, and that's going to be a five book series um, following her progression from, you know, werewolf hunter apprentice to something very different. I'm going to be rapid releasing those next year, so I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds fantastic. And with the red hair, I'm always a sucker for a little red riding hood. Yes. And that that makes me think of that movie that came out in what was it 2012, Red Riding Hood with uh, yes. Amanda Seyfried. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Oh man. I uh, see. Yeah, I, I I love werewolves and so I tend to like put versions of them in that. So I've got like the stolen series, I have Shadow Wolves, which is kind of a very fantasy take. On, on a form of werewolves, you might say. Um, so I'm always finding ways to slip them into my stories. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to save this video to Instagram TV okay. and let, let people interact with it. And we'll come back tomorrow and we'll pick a winner. That sounds great. I love it. Sounds great. We're, oh, I forgot to announce this when we started the video. That is on me. Um, if you comment on this video and share, like it, what have you, we are going to select a winner to give away Merlina's book, The Seeking. Yes. <laughs> so leave your answers and questions and comments down below and you'll be hearing from us. Yep. All right. Bye, Merlina. Have a happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Hi everyone, I am Brianna Sikowski, author of Disenchanted. 
Um, I'm super grateful the Parliament House still let me participate. Um, I wrote this in labor, just deciding that I cannot pass up the opportunity at all to write about one of my favorite characters that are not Lilac and Garen. Um, and this does take place after Disillusion, so right after the end of book two. And I do hope that it invokes a little bit of anticipation <laughs> because a lot happens between now and then. Um, yeah, so this is my piece of the Heart Story anthology, and I hope you enjoy. Um, thanks for watching. <laughs> Have a safe Halloween. My customers are often chosen by two fascinating factors. The first is how long they're willing to sit across from me, fidgeting in fear. The second is how desperately they require my aid. The bloke who traveled two towns over, hoping to replenish his shillings after gambling away every last bit of his land tax, would receive an instant denial from me. After all, I'm a degenerate, not a silversmith, and if I could create money, then why would I spend my time entertaining humans? More questionable is the heartbroken housewife, who thought her partner's wandering eye would dissipate after giving him children. She wanted me to make his part shrivel off, but what good would that do for her? Instead, I made her garden flourish, setting the tone for her own market venture should she choose. And cursed him, making all working animals absolutely rabid in his presence. Who in their right minds would show interest in a man who couldn't tend the farm, much less travel? No. It's those who come seeking beneficial retribution that tip the scale of fortune in their favor and ultimately garner my most gracious pity. But truth be told, magic simply does not work in the way that humans think it does. And intent and raw emotion far surpass quality ingredients or poetic spells. Even after decades, I'm still caught off guard now and then. Such as the ragged nitwit who roused me from my slumber only to first vomit on my doorstep. Her suffering brings me much joy, but curiosity smothered my hatred. After all, the pooling blood on her kirtle was fresh. Speak, I told her. Please, Garen's gone. At this I offer her my sincerest congratulations, as it is an accomplishment shaking that one. Kestrel took him hostage and will use him to destroy the kingdom and Brasiliand, your swamp included. I stare at her dead in the eye. No, he won't.